provide to the aviation industry in Wales to get it through yet another difficult summer and ensure that it has. Well, Mr. Speaker. First of all, welcome very much the Honourable Lady's support for the airline industry and for her stated view that we should get people back into planes and flying around as much as we possibly can. And it's in stark contrast to some of the uh, some, some people in her party who seem to take an extreme environmental view that nobody should ever go into a plane. So I very much welcome that support for the airline industry. I can assure the Honourable Lady that we meet with the airline industry on a regular basis. I've spoken to the uh, space aerospace trade body about uh, about 10 days ago i met with airbus online a few days ago we haven't taken up a sector specific support because this uk government believes that we should be able to go out there and help all businesses that have been affected by this pandemic and that's why as i said we've already put out that 2.75 billion pounds for welsh businesses and i hope she would welcome that research by the center for progressive policy has shown that uk government covid emergency support was on average £1,000 more generous to London residents than to those in Wales, and that the UK Government spent nearly £7 billion more on London than it otherwise would have done if each nation and region of the UK had been allocated the same amount of emergency spending per resident. What explanation has the Minister been given by Cabinet colleagues for this discrepancy? Well, Mr Speaker, the, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that the money has gone to those in need in all parts of the United Kingdom. I have already mentioned the £8.75 billion extra that went to the Welsh Government and the £2.7 billion for Welsh businesses and the 466,000 Welsh workers who were supported through the furlough scheme. And to be honest with you, I really welcome these questions because they give me an opportunity to spell out uh, the huge amount of support that the Government has delivered for Wales. But on a UK-wide basis, UK -wide, the, the UK Government has spent £280 billion supporting people from across the whole of the United Kingdom. With the greatest respect to the Honourable Gentleman, I don't think an independent Wales would have been able to manage that level of support. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Go on, John. Mr Speaker, last week's Queen's speech announced legislation on procurement which will increase flexibility for contracting authorities and reduce bureaucracy. And This will simplify procurement in the public sector and help support Welsh businesses. I very much hope the Welsh Government will join us in further supporting Welsh companies. The Minister will be aware that the Department of Transport are spending billions on their programme to decarbonise transport, but they don't seem so interested in building our green manufacturing capacity. So does he share my concern at recent reports of Welsh councils buying green buses not from British firms but from China? So will he hold urgent discussions with councils, government and with the Transport Secretary in London to demand taxpayer-funded green subsidies support British industry and British jobs? Yeah. Minister. Well, first of all, Mr Speaker, I'm absolutely delighted that the Honourable Gentleman has recognised and said in his question that this government is spending billions of pounds supporting green industries. He's absolutely right in that. Now, I don't know which specific councils he means. I know that Newport Labour Council recently bought some electric buses. Um, I have no idea where they bought them from, but, it, but um, if he has a problem with the way in which Newport Labour Council are conducting procurement, then perhaps he'd, perhaps he'd like to discuss it with some of his Labour colleagues. The Honourable Gentleman will certainly know that we do, of course, have to uh, abide by WTO, the WTO treaty agreement, and I don't suppose he's uh, advising me to break our international treaty obligations, but if he is, I look forward to hearing more about it. Hey, number 16, sir. Minister. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the results of the recent election clearly showed that a majority of voters in Wales and in Scotland actually voted for pro-unionist parties. It is clear that voters in Wales want the freedom to be able to study, to work, to live, to travel freely between England and Wales without a border. Sir Edward, apart from evident self-interest, Will my honourable friend agree that the union, following his elections, is ever stronger because of yeah. abundant common interest? Minister. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, the honourable gentleman has been in this house for many years and uh, has a great deal of wisdom. And he makes an important point. We are united by a shared love of the union, our United Kingdom, yeah. and the firm belief that we are stronger together than apart. If somebody wants to do a little tapping, there is room outside for that. Let's go now to a substantive question for Minister Davis again. Mr Speaker, this fiscal settlement delivers for Wales. 
This year, the Welsh Government will receive almost £19 billion of block grant funding, which is a billion pounds more than was agreed with the Welsh Labour Government as being a fair settlement for Wales. Let's go to Deirdre Brook. Deirdre. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The fiscal settlement, of course, won't matter all that much if the possible trade deal with Australia goes through with a zero tariff regime, which would cause serious difficulties for Welsh and indeed Scottish farmers. What compensation for those farmers is being built into the fiscal settlement should this latest gung-ho trade deal scupper their livelihoods? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, no, no trade deal has been signed yet, but I was on a call with the NFU yesterday who actually said that they welcomed uh, the principle of a trade deal. and They have a few concerns about some of the details, and we will continue our discussions uh, with the NFU and with farmers. But I'm surprised the Honourable Lady, I think, uh, was in favour of having a free trade deal with the European Union. Why would she not want to have a free trade deal with a country with which we all, Mr Speaker, she and I, in fact, personally, have very close links indeed. Thank you. John Powell. Yeah. Number 18, sir. <laughs> Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Senate election has shown that three out of four voters rejected separatism, recognising that there are economic prosperities indelibly linked to being part of the Union. John Howell. Thank you. I am concerned that one of the first priorities of the Welsh Government seems to be a universal basic income. Is my right honourable friend aware of the debate that I took part in at the Council of Europe in which we discussed all of this and which the idea was completely rubbished? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, any, anybody who thinks this is a good idea should knock, on, uh, knock some doors of voters in working families. It might sound radical to academics and policy wonks, but it sounds out of touch if you ask most normal people. Mr Speaker, those aren't in fact my words. Those are the words of the new economy minister in Welsh Government. So it seems to me that they've got a problem in their own ranks, let alone trying to persuade us of the merits of it. Let's go to Christina Rees. Chris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Secretary of State accept that it's Mark Drakeford's superb stewardship of the Welsh economy and Welsh NHS that secured Mark's overwhelming re-election? Will he welcome the Welsh Labour Government's new 10-year infrastructure investment plan for a zero carbon economy and release the promised UK Government funding for the Global Centre of Rail Excellence to be built in my niece constituency? Mr. Speaker, um, many questions included in that, but uh, uh, I'm delighted to uh, uh, have played a part in getting the Global Centre of Rail Excellence uh, situated uh, in her constituency. That was a government announcement by the Chancellor in the budget. Uh, so uh, it shows that actually collaboration can work when we uh, uh, try to uh, achieve those aims. And it's certainly, as far as COVID reaction is concerned, um, that has been a team effort. It has been a cross UK effort. And the vaccination programme is probably the clearest indication of why the union matters and how we've been able to work collaboratively with our colleagues in Welsh Government to deliver something which is genuinely a benefit to the entire nation. Stephen Crump. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The recent elections did demonstrate that... The, oh, beg your pardon. Question number 20. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, my run friend, the Prime Minister, spoke to the First Minister shortly following the election result. I have extended an invitation to meet the new Minister for the Economy. Uh, we've had calls with the um, uh, First Minister and the uh, CDL last week, and another one due this evening. Stephen Crump. Apologies, Mr. Speaker. I'm uh, out of practice. Um, <laughs> The, uh, Mr Speaker, the recent elections demonstrated that the vast majority of voters in Wales have no time for independence. They have little time for ripping up the devolution settlement either. What I think they showed is that they want their politicians and ministers at either end of the M4 to work together to make good things happen to work for Wales, to make Wales a stronger, more prosperous part of the UK. Given that the success of the vaccination programme shows that it can be done, what needs to happen now to unblock other important policies like free ports, which are stuck between UK and Welsh Government? Sherry State. Well, my right honourable friend is absolutely spot on. We've had considerable interest, really enthusiastic interest in the uh, uh, free port uh, programme from across the whole of Wales. Um, it will bring 15,000 jobs. Uh, it's a manifesto commitment. The only obstacle standing between us and delivering it uh, is currently Welsh Government. So I'm determined to work collaboratively, as we've said before, to get this over the line and any pressure that anybody in this house can bring to bear to help us achieve that will be very welcome. We're now moving to questions to the Prime Minister and we're now going to start with question one, Gareth Thomas. Number one, Mr Speaker. 
Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, an inquest found Francis Quinn, Father Hugh Mullen, Noel Phillips, Joan Connolly, Daniel Teggart, Joseph Murphy, Edward Doherty, John Laverty, Joseph Corr, and John McCurr, who were killed in Ballymurphy in August 1971, entirely innocent. On behalf of successive governments and to put on the record in this House, I would like to say sorry to their families for how the investigations were handled and for the pain they've endured since their campaign began almost five decades ago. No apology, Mr Speaker, can lessen their lasting pain. I hope they may take some comfort in the answers they have secured and in knowing that this has renewed the Government's determination to ensure in future that other families can find answers with less distress and delay. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Good. Mr Speaker, I strongly associate myself with the uh, earlier part of the uh, comments that the Prime Minister yeah. made. Yeah. Can I raise something uh, slightly different, uh, though? It's nearly four years since the Grenfell Tower tragedy claimed some 72 lives. Yet hundreds of thousands of families still live in unsafe, unsellable homes, and many leaseholders face crippling debts yes. through no fault of their own. Trident Point, Pearmain House, Amber Court, all in my constituency. Given this was the biggest building scandal in modern UK yeah. history, why did the Prime Minister order his MPs to vote down our efforts yesterday to get this scandal sorted once and for all? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, it, I, 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 in no way I underestimate the, 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 the suffering of, of those who, uh, the, the, the victims of Grenfell and also those uh, whose, whose buildings, uh, whose homes uh, have been prejudiced by uh, the, the spectre of unsafe uh, materials. And that's why we provided an unprecedented £5 billion uh, pounds of investment. And I can tell him also that the most dangerous cladding is already gone or is going uh, from uh, all high-rise buildings. And we certainly agree that leaseholders uh, should be protected uh, from, from remediation costs and people in high-rise buildings will, play, will pay nothing uh, to replace uh, their unsafe cladding. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister will understand that Havering, just like Hillingdon, is located on the outskirts of London and has very different needs and aspirations from those in the core area of the city. My borough still prides itself as part of Essex, and I know that his does as part of historic Middlesex. And whilst we need cooperation on things like transport, will he accept that it is time for wholesale reform of the way London and the wider region are governed and support my campaign to allow boroughs like Havering to take back control <laughs> from the Mayor and City Hall interference, allowing Havering and indeed all outer London boroughs the freedom to make their own decisions that best meet the needs of local people. Well, I, I can understand the feelings of, of, of frustration uh, that uh, the people of Havering may feel about uh, a current Mayor of London uh, who does not understand the needs of outer London, uh, who has not uh, invested in outer London in the, in the way that a previous Mayor did, uh, who I seem to recall set up the Outer London Fund uh, and, and, drove, and drove through many other benefits for the outer boroughs. But uh, I, I must tell him in all candour that what we need to do is work together uh, to ensure that that glad day returns when we have a Mayor who truly represents all Londoners, Mr Speaker. Now comes the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the Prime Minister's comments on the Ballymurphy uh, inquest and the sentiment uh, behind them? Does the Prime Minister agree that the single biggest threat to hitting the June 21st date for unlocking is the risk of new variants coming into the UK? Prime Minister. I, Mr Speaker, I certainly think that that is uh, one of the uh, issues that we must face, but perhaps it would be for the benefit of the House if I update uh, the House on uh, where we are, because we've looked at the data again this morning, and I can, I can tell them, uh, the House, Mr Speaker, that we have increasing confidence that vaccines are effective against uh, all, uh, all variants, including 
uh, the Indian variant, to his, uh, to his point. And I, I want particularly uh, in this context to uh, thank the people uh, of, uh, of Bolton, of Blackburn, and many other places who have been coming forward in record numbers, Mr Speaker, to get vaccinated, to get their, their first jabs and their second jabs, uh, Mr Speaker. I think the numbers have doubled in Bolton alone, and I think the people of this country can be proud of their participation. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, I think that is a yes, that the risk of other variants coming through our borders is one of the biggest threats to unlocking. We are not just talking about the Indian variant, we are talking about future variants. In those circumstances, why on Monday did the Prime Minister choose to weaken travel restrictions by moving 170 countries or territories to the amber list? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, we have one of the strongest border regimes anywhere in the, in the world. Uh, there, are, there are currently uh, 43 countries on the, on the red list, uh, Mr Speaker. But if you're uh, coming from an amber list country, everybody uh, should know uh, that if you travel to an amber list country for, uh, for any emergency or any, uh, extre any extreme reason that you, you have for doing so, you, when you come back, Mr Speaker, uh, I mean, you not only have to pay for all the, the tests, but you, when you come back you have to self-isolate uh, for 10 days. Uh, we will invigilate, we are invigilating it, and uh, people who fail to obey uh, the, the quarantine can face fines, Mr Speaker, of up to £10,000. Mr Speaker, I think everybody would agree that having moved 170 countries to the amber list, absolute clarity is needed about the circumstance in which people can travel to an amber country. Yesterday morning, the Environment Secretary said people could fly to Amberless countries if they wanted to visit family or friends. By the afternoon, a government health minister said nobody should travel outside Britain this year and travelling is dangerous. The Prime Minister said that travel to Amber countries should only be where it's essential. By the evening, the Welsh Secretary suggested some people might think a holiday is essential. The government's lost control of the messaging. So can the Prime Minister answer a really simple question that goes to the heart of this? If, if, if he doesn't want people to travel to amber list countries, if that's his position, he doesn't want them to travel to amber list countries, why has he made it easier for them to do so? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I think that after more than a year of this, I think the, 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 the Honourable Gentleman, right Honourable Gentleman would understand that what the public would like to see is some effort to back up uh, what the government is saying, uh, to, to deliver uh, clarity uh, of messages. And, and, and on his point about legal bans, as he knows, we're trying to move away from endlessly legislating uh, for everything and to rely on guidance and, uh, and asking people do, to do the right thing. And it is very, very clear, Mr Speaker, you should not be going to an amber list country, except for some extreme circumstance, such as the, uh, the serious illness of a, of a family member. You should not be going to an amber list country on holiday, uh, Mr Speaker. I can imagine he wants to, uh, to take a holiday, but you should not be going to an amber list country on holiday, uh, Mr Speaker. And uh, if, you, if you do go to an amber list country, then, as I say, uh, we will enforce the 10-day quarantine uh, period, uh, and if you, if you break the rules, you face very substantial fines. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, that completely swerves the question. The point was, if it is only in extreme circumstances, the Prime Minister's word, why make it easier to go? If it is extreme circumstances, why make it easier to go? And Mr Speaker, let's test it by looking at the consequences. Since the government loosened travel restrictions, 150 flights a day are going to amber list countries, and travel agents are reporting surges in holiday bookings to those countries. Prime Minister, this isn't just a coincidence. It's because of the messaging. So can the Prime Minister tell the House how many people are now travelling to and from Britain from amber list countries every day? Prime Minister. Uh, well, I can tell the House, Mr Speaker, is that there has been a 95 per cent reduction in uh, travel of any kind uh, to and from this country, and that is exactly what uh, you would expect in the circumstances of this uh, pandemic. Uh, there are 43 countries on the red list, and if you come back from one of those countries, you have to go immediately into, uh, into hotel 
quarantine. And uh, the reason that we're able uh, to, to move forward in the way that we have is because, as I have told the House repeatedly, we are continuing with the fastest vaccination rollout. Uh, yeah. I think just about anywhere in uh, in, in Europe, and uh, as of today, 70%, Mr. Speaker, of the adults in this country have been vaccinated, and I think that is a fantastic achievement, and that is enabling us to make the progress that we are. Here's Starmer. That's an I don't know, and the suggestion that in the last the, the suggestion that in the last few days there's been a 95% drop off in travel to ambulist countries, Prime Minister, I don't think holds water. And I'm trying to understand the logic of the government's position. We know that new variants are the single biggest risk to unlocking. We know that the government doesn't think people should travel to ambulist countries, save in extreme circumstances. But the government's made it easier to do so. The messaging is confused and contradictory, and as a result, Prime Minister, this week, many people are now travelling to ambulance countries, but the, co the government can't say how many or when. Mr Speaker, we're an island nation. We have the power to stop this. Why doesn't the Prime Minister drop this hopeless system, get control of our borders, and introduce a proper system that can protect against the threat of future variants of the virus? Prime Minister. Actually, Mr. Speaker, I think what would be helpful, I've, I've, I've set out the position about ambulance countries, I think, uh, very clearly, at least, at least twice. Wouldn't it be great, Mr. Speaker, to hear the right honourable gentleman to back it up for a change, uh, get it, you know, using, using what authority he possesses uh, to convey the message uh, to, to, to the rest of the, of the country? Actually, Mr. Speaker, when you look at the, the Labour position on, on borders, it's, it's hopelessly confused. Last night, I think the Shadow Home Secretary said that they wanted to cut, the whole, cut this country off from from the rest of the world, Mr. Speaker, pause all travel, pause all travel, even though 75% of our medicines and 50% of our food actually come from abroad, uh, Mr. Speaker. And it was only, only recently that he was saying that quarantine was a blunt instrument and he'd rather see alternatives. Yes, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is just wrong again. We've called for a blanket hotel quarantine for months. I raised it here three times at Prime Minister's questions. The government ignored it every time, and look where we are now, talking about the Indian variant. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister's former adviser had this one right. He said the government's border policy was a joke. Our borders have been wide out open pretty well throughout the pandemic. There was no hotel quarantine system in place until February this year, for that's not true. Flights are still coming in from India, and even as the variant is spreading, the Prime Minister decides now is the time to weaken the system even more. It's ridiculous. Finally, Mr Speaker, I want to raise, I want to raise the appalling rise in anti-Semitism in the last week and the attacks and the violence we've seen. On Saturday, a rabbi in Chigwell was hospitalised after being attacked outside his synagogue. Many of us will have seen the appalling incident in Golders Green and the Community Security Trust report a 500% rise in anti-Semitic incidents since the break, outbreak of violence in Gaza and Israel. Now, I know the government is working on this, and both the Prime Minister and I have condemned these anti-Semitic attacks and violence. But we will all know across this House that Jewish communities remain very anxious. So what more does the Prime Minister think can be done to provide the extra support and protection needed to reassure Jewish communities at this really very difficult time. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I, I, I share his horror at uh, the outbreak of anti-Semitic uh, incidents and uh, the government has conveyed uh, that message uh, loud and clear to those who are responsible for enforcing the law against hate crime uh, of that kind. But obviously we will continue to work and uh, to support the Jewish community in any way that we can, particularly working with the Community Safety Trust, who do an absolutely outstanding job, uh, in my view, uh, but also showing as a country and as a society that we will call this out at every stage, Mr Speaker. We will not let it take root. We will not allow it to grow and fester. And in welcoming uh, his remarks, I, I, I may say I think it's one of the uh, most important changes of attitude, uh, or U-turns, I should say, that I've seen uh, from the Labour Party in recent times. And I'm, and I'm, de I'm, delighted, I'm delighted that he's taking, he's taking that attitude. I'm delighted that he's taking that attitude now. But I think what this, what this country 
Uh, what this country wants to see, Mr Speaker, is a government that gets on with delivering on the people's priorities, making everybody safe. And it might have been a good thing, Mr Speaker, if he had voted, if he had voted and he got his party to vote for tougher sentences for, against serious and violent sexual offenders, to say nothing of people who commit hate crime. I think, in fairness, this House is very united and will re remain united. And of course, we do support the CST. Let's come to Mary Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My second AstraZeneca uh, jab reinforced my confidence, yeah. not only in normal life resuming, but also in the future of our life science industry. In Cheadle and across South Manchester and the Cheshire Life Science Corridor, investment in R&D and innovation will bring high-skilled, well-paid jobs. Will the Prime Minister join me in recognising and endorsing the work of our northern universities, NHS trusts and life science sector, who, together with the Northern Health Science Alliance, are piloting health tech initiatives which will take us forward from jabs to jobs? Yes, Prime Minister. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. And I thank my honourable friend, who is a great advocate for the people uh, of Cheadle. And uh, as part of our plan to move from jabs, jabs, jabs to jobs, 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 I'm delighted to say that over a billion pounds worth of government-funded science and innovation projects are currently taking place across uh, the North West. Uh, thanks, uh, largely or at least in part, to her advocacy. Let's go to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Ian. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Prime Minister for his comments on the Bally Murphy inquest. Mr Speaker, as a member of Scotland's Crofton community, I understand just how disastrous a Brexit trade deal with Australia, as proposed by this Tory government, be for Scotland's farming and crofting sectors. If reports of this Tory deal are true, farmers will lose their livelihoods, rural businesses will collapse, and ultimately, families will be driven off the land. And let's be very clear, if that happens, this UK Tory government will be solely responsible. So just for once, Prime Minister, give a straight answer to these farming and crofting families who are living with this threat. Can the Prime Minister categorically rule out that his government is prepared to sign up to a trade deal that will at any future point guarantee tariff-free access to Australian lamb and beef? Yes or no? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I know that the Right Honourable, I'm delighted to see the shots of his croft, uh, by the way, uh, the, 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 the humble, the humble uh, representative of the, of the crofting uh, community. May, may I say that I, I don't think that he does justice uh, to, uh, to crofters, to farmers across the country uh, and across and in Scotland as well, Mr Speaker, because I think he grossly underestimates their ability uh, to uh, do great things with our free trade deals, to export Scottish beef around the world, Mr Speaker. Why doesn't he believe in what the people of Scotland can do, Mr Speaker? Why is he so frightened of free trade? I think there's a massive opportunity for Scotland and for the whole of the UK, and he should seize it and be proud of it. Going back to Ian Blackford. Ian. Thank you, Mr Speaker. That was quite chilling, to try and treat something as serious as this in the way that the government and the Prime Minister has done is really quite pathetic. The fact that the Prime Minister couldn't give a straight answer will send a real chill across Scotland's farming communities. The UK government led the betrayal of Scottish fishing, and now the Tories are planning to throw our farmers and crofters under their Brexit bus. This morning, Martin Kennedy, President of the National Farmers Union Scotland, told ITV that farmers will feel seriously betrayed by these proposals. This deal would be the final nail in the coffin for many Scottish crofters and farmers. It will end a way of life that has endured for generations. Generations, Prime Minister. I know that many of the Prime Minister's Tory colleagues privately agree with me and want him to pull back from this deal. So will the Prime Minister finally listen, think again, and ditch a deal that will send our farmers down under? My Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I, I, I really think, well, first of all, he's totally wrong about what he says about the fisheries, uh, because, in fact, there are massive opportunities for fisheries for the whole uh, of the UK as we take back control of our territorial waters. And that will be the same for Scotland and around the UK. And I think, he, again, he is, he is, he is uh, grossly um, underestimating the ability of the, the people of this country, the, the agricultural communities of this country, uh, the, the farming industry, to make the most of free trade. This is a country, this is a country that, that 
that grew uh, successful and prosperous on free trade, on exporting around the world. Our food exports are second to none, Mr yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he should be proud of that. He should be celebrating that. And all he does, Mr Speaker, is call for us to put up the drawbridge and go back into the EU to be run by Brussels. That's his manifesto, and I, I, I think the people of this country have decisively rejected it. John Gideon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. North Staff's YMCA in my constituency undertakes fantastic work transforming the lives of young people locally in the Stoke-on-Trent community, and I am delighted that they have been recognised for their work through the Queen's Award for Enterprise. There is no better example of levelling up in action, and I would like to invite the Prime Minister to join me in congratulating all the staff, volunteers and partners of the YMCA in North Staffordshire, and I look forward to showing him levelling up in action when he next visits Stoke-on-Trent, the new second home of the Home Office. Yay! Prime Minister. I, I thank uh, my, my honourable friend very much, and uh, she's totally right, and it's part of our levelling up. We're, we're absolutely determined to do this as fast as we possibly can. I uh, thank you for uh, my honourable friend's message about it this morning. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are sending, we are sending uh, n uh, not just back offices, Mr Speaker, uh, but uh, some of the most important departments of state will be, running, will be run uh, from around our great cities and towns in the whole of the UK, and I believe that will have a dramatic effect on levelling up across the UK. And I, I'm thankful to her for her question. Ed Davey. Mr Speaker, local planning reforms introduced by Liberal Democrat ministers have seen communities across England vote for new developments, including new housing, new affordable housing, new community facilities, whilst also protecting the environment of the countryside. So why is the Prime Minister so determined to push through his planning reforms that will do nothing to solve the country's real housing crisis will allow developers to ride roughshod over local communities and will mean, in the words of his immediate predecessor as Prime Minister, the wrong homes being built in the wrong places. Mr. Mr Speaker, he's completely wrong and uh, he should look at the bill when it comes forward uh, because uh, we want to protect the green belt, we want to protect our wonderful open spaces. Uh, this is a government that understands the value of the, uh, of the countryside and, and rural, uh, rural Britain, uh, but we also think that young people uh, have been deprived for too long of the ability to get onto the housing ladder, Mr Speaker, and it's not just in the South East, it's across the country, and that's why we're bringing forward sensible reforms to allow brownfield sites to go ahead. Andrew Buck. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Two weeks ago, in giving the Scottish Conservatives their highest ever number of votes in the era of devolution, the Scottish people decided that Scotland would remain at the heart of this newly reinvigorated global Britain. So with that in mind, would the Prime Minister accept my invitation to Stonehaven in my constituency to come and plant one of 120 cherry blossom trees Lovely. donated by the Sakura Cherry Blossom Tree Trust to celebrate oh. the deep and growing links between our country and that other great trading nation, Japan. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, and uh, I, I think that uh, such a gesture will be the cherry on the cake of the, tr of the, tr of the free trade deal that we've already done. How will it? Thank you, Mr Speaker. In 2019, before visiting Wales, the Prime Minister said, I will always back Britain's great farmers. Now it looks as if he's backing Australia's farmers instead. So will he uh, today keep to his word, really back Welsh farmers and permanently rule out tariff-free access for Australian lamb and beef imports? Well, yeah. uh, Mr Prime Speaker, I will, I will back Britain's farmers and Welsh farmers uh, in exporting uh, their fantastic lamb around the world. Mr Speaker, is it not a disgrace uh, that not a single morsel of Welsh lamb has so passed the lips of the Americans in the last 20 years? Uh, or more, Mr Speaker? Uh, uh, what about China, Mr Speaker? Has he no ambition? Uh, for the people of this country or for the people of Wales or for Welsh farmers. I do. This government does, Mr Speaker. That's why we're getting on with our agenda. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister or Prevawen Needog agree with me that a free port on Anglesey would create much needed skilled jobs and investment, protect our precious Welsh language and culture and breathe fire into the nostrils of the Welsh dragon? And will the Prime Minister accept an invitation on behalf of the people of Arnest Morn to join me on a tour of the island to include a panad at the Truck Stop Cafe in Hollyhead? Yeah. Uh, Prime Minister. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, Mr Speaker, it says here that I mustn't express a, a preference on the, on the location of, of free ports, and I won't, but she makes, a, uh, she makes a, an outstanding case as, as ever, uh, and, uh, she, and she is, uh, together with uh, uh, the, the, our Welsh colleagues, uh, she, uh, Welsh Conservative colleagues, I believe she is helping now uh, to apply the, 
the vixen halo to the bunged up nostrils of the Welsh dragon. Richard Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, despite the opprobrium which the Prime Minister always seems to seek to heap upon the Scottish National Party, at the Scottish elections two weeks ago, the SNP was returned to government with twice the number of MSPs as their nearest rivals in the Scottish Conservatives, securing 48% of the vote, 49% of the seats in the proportional system, and with 51% of voters backing parties which support an independence referendum in the current term. So, if the Prime Minister genuinely believes that his criticism of the Scottish Government have any merit whatsoever. Why does he consider that the Scottish National Party did so well in those elections while his own party did so badly? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, 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 I totally regret to reject what he's just said. I, I noticed that actually the, the Scottish National Party did less well uh, than they did previously under Alex Salmond uh, in 2011. I hesitate to point that out uh, to, the, to, the, to the Honourable Member, but that is, the, that is, the, that is the, the reality. And I think the reason for that is that the people of Scotland, notwithstanding uh, the, the nationalist approach that he takes, the people of Scotland have been very disappointed uh, by the actual record of the Scottish Government in fighting crime, in improving education and in making Scotland a great place uh, to live and to invest. And that is the failing of which his Government is being held to account. Danny Kruger. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, a large part of Salisbury Plain falls in my constituency of Devizes. And I therefore have the honour to represent a, a lot of serving soldiers and veterans and their families. So my right honourable friend will understand that feelings are running high in Wiltshire about the treatment of uh, British Army veterans of the conflict in Northern Ireland. Can he assure me that legislation will be brought forward in this session to protect veterans from further prosecutions or investigations unless compelling new evidence is brought forward? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the House will have understood from my opening apology how difficult and how uh, complex uh, and how fraught these issues are but we are committed to introduce legislation uh, in this session uh, to address the legacy of the troubles in, in Northern Ireland and to introducing a, a fair package uh, for veterans as well and to protect them uh, as I've said many times before from unfair vexatious litigation when no new evidence has been brought forward. Gerald Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There were no new measures in the Queen's speech to tackle youth unemployment. There are over 500,000 unemployed young people in this country, yet the government's flagship youth unemployment scheme is nowhere near sufficient, only helping around 1 in 25 young people. I and my honourable friend for Blaine Gwent have already requested a meeting with the Minister to discuss local concerns from training providers and local businesses. So could I ask the Prime Minister what exactly he's going to do to address this and to safeguard the future of a generation of young people in this country? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're putting two, but very quickly, Mr Speaker, we're putting £2 billion into the Kickstart programme for 18 to 24-year-olds uh, and, uh, uh, and investing massively in the Restart programme for those who've been uh, longer out of work. But uh, can, I t I, I, can I also tell them that the businesses I talk to are currently facing shortages of workers in many, many sectors, and we will work flat out to ensure that we get uh, those who want jobs uh, to those uh, who need uh, workers as well. James Carpenter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for the support he's already shown for coming forward with an offshore transmission grid, which he knows will help us both to export our surplus offshore wind into the continent and reduce the infrastructure associated with uh, new wind farm capacity. So it's very important to our communities. But there's a question over timing. So given that he's already set out a very ambitious and clear timetable to increasing offshore wind generation, will he now come out with an equally ambitious timetable for delivering an offshore grid? Prime Minister. Uh, my honourable friend is spot on in what he says about the need for an offshore grid uh, as well as the building the, 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 the fantastic uh, windmills. It's vital that we bring the, the energy onshore uh, in a way that is, uh, uh, as, uh, has minimal disruption uh, for local uh, communities and enables us to, to maximise efficiency. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. What does the Prime Minister think when he hears Jenny McGee, the nurse who saved his life, say of NHS staff, we're not getting the respect and now pay that we deserve. I'm just sick of it, so I've handed in my resignation. Surely even he must pause and think, what can be learned from the mistakes of the past year? What Jenny calls the indecisiveness and mixed messages of his government. And will he think again about giving nurses more than an insulting 1% pay rise? Yeah. 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 Minister. 
Uh, Mr Speaker, I think the whole House acknowledges our collective debt to the nurses of the NHS, and I certainly acknowledge my own huge personal debt. And that's why, uh, of all the professions uh, in this country, Mr Speaker, in very, very tough times, uh, we have asked the Public Sector Pay Review Board to look at uh, an increase in pay for nurses. But in the meantime, we have increased starting salary for nurses by 12.8%. We have put in uh, the bursary worth £5,000. We've restored that, Mr Speaker, uh, as well as £3,000 for extra help. But above all, Mr Speaker, to all nurses, and I know what a tough year they have had. I know how hard it has been on the front line coping with this pandemic. We have done what I think is the most important thing of all, and that is to recruit many more nurses. There are now about 11,000 more nurses in the NHS today than there were this time last year, and there are 60,000 more, Mr Speaker, in training. And we are on target to reach our target of 50,000 more nurses in the NHS. And to James Davies. Following on that theme, Mr Speaker, patients in England have unfettered access to specialist hospital care anywhere in England, including within world-leading centres of excellence. But my constituents in North Wales have no such automatic choice, with access dependent on restrictive contracts or individual funding requests. So will my right honourable friend do all he can to ensure that health care features prominently within the UK levelling up agenda. Prime Minister. Yes, I, I thank my uh, honourable friend for, uh, for his point and he, he knows uh, a great deal about uh, the subject. Uh, we've worked very hard with the, uh, with the Welsh Government throughout the pandemic, uh, supporting uh, them with uh, £8.6 billion pounds of, uh, of additional funding through the, through the Barnet formula. Uh, but clearly we need to learn the lessons together as we, as we bounce forward from this pandemic. Just in matters. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's now 664 days since the Prime Minister said he had a plan for social care. But the Department for Health and Social Care are advertising at the moment for social care policy advisers to, and I quote, develop proposals for reform. Why do that if there is a plan already? Every day more people lose their life savings to pay huge social care costs, and we can't even get a straight answer as to whether the government have a plan to fix social care, never mind find out what it actually is. So just tell us, Prime Minister. Do you have a plan, yes or no? Yes. Uh, Mr Speaker, yes is the answer, but I mean, the, 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 Labour Party, the, the Labour Party junked it, junked it in 1990. This is, some, this is something that for decades uh, politicians have failed to address. 1999, Labour failed to uh, address the plan. They, they had 13, year, 13 years in government, Mr Speaker. I think it was 13. 13 unlucky years for this country. They didn't do it. And they didn't do it. And this government is going to tackle it. This government is going to, is going to finally going to address the issue of social care. And if they want to support it, with their customary, with their customary doughty, uh, doughty resolve, Mr. Speaker, if they want to support it without wibble wobbling from one week to the next in whatever their policy is, uh, then uh, w without changing like weather vanes, uh, which is what they normally do, if they want to support it, if they want to back it, then I'm all ears, Mr. Speaker. Higginbotham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Throughout this week, businesses across Burnley and Paddyham have reopened their doors to customers inside, yeah. from Usher and Molly Rigby's to Bellissimo and Real Cinema. Would the Prime Minister join with me in wishing them all the best of luck as they get back on yeah. their feet? And does he also agree with me that if we're to support local businesses in the long term, we need to create the environment and the opportunities they need to succeed? And that includes schemes like the Leveling Up Fund and yeah. the Lifetime Skills Guarantee. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, that's why we're, uh, we're investing, for instance, uh, 3.6 million pounds from the Getting Building Fund for the development of, uh, of Pioneer Place. Uh, Burnley will also benefit from our, our High Streets Task Force. But what, in, what uh, Burnley and towns uh, across the country need more than anything else is passionate leadership, uh, such as my honourable friend shows in championing uh, the, their localities and getting the right investment in. Final question, David Lind. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, yeah, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will be aware of Gladys's proposal to close the McVitie's factory in Glasgow's East End, putting at risk up to 470 local jobs. So, will the Prime Minister join with me in engaging with Gladys Global CEO Salman Amin and call upon him to rethink these plans, which would definitely unleash economic Armageddon on a very, very, very fragile part of the local economy? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, I'm, I think uh, McVitie's have been a proud part of the Scottish economy. Uh, since uh, 1800, and uh, I, know, I know that uh, 
people at the, at the Toll Cross uh, factory, their, their relatives, will be very concerned about uh, what's happening. I thank him uh, for raising it. I know that conversations are, uh, are now going on uh, to see what we can uh, do with I think it's the Turkish company uh, that, that now owns um, Vitis. Uh, and I know my honourable friend, the Secretary of State for, for Scotland, is, uh, is meeting the honourable uh, member to discuss the situation. I am now suspending the House for three minutes to enable necessary arrangements for the next business. Order. Order. I call Wayne David to ask his urgent question. Wayne David. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I wish to ask the Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Affairs if you will make a statement on the UK's Government's efforts to secure a ceasefire in Israel and Gaza. I now call Minister James Cleverley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Since I was last at the dispatch box on the 13th of May, we have sadly seen further violence and more civilian deaths. I am sure the House will join me in offering condolences to all the families of those civilians who have been killed or injured across Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. 
Uh, Mr Speaker, with your uh, permission, I will set out to the House the work that the Government is doing, along with others, to bring about a peaceful resolution. We are urging the parties to work with mediators towards an immediate ceasefire to prevent further loss of life and a worsening humanitarian situation. We are supporting the United Nations, Egyptian and Qatari efforts to that end, and we work closely with the United States. We are also prioritising our own diplomatic efforts through both bilateral and multilateral channels. The Foreign Secretary and I, with the support of our diplomats on the ground, have been working to progress the conditions needed for an immediate ceasefire. The Foreign Secretary has spoken in recent days with the Israeli Foreign Minister and the Palestinian Prime Minister, where he reinforced our clear message of de-escalation and our desire to work together to end the violence. I delivered similar messages to the, amb to the Israeli Ambassador and the Palestinian Head of Mission in London. We have also engaged regional partners at ministerial level. The Foreign Secretary spoke with the Foreign Minister of Jordan on the 17th of May, and I spoke just this morning with uh, a number of ambassadors from Arab states to reiterate the need for immediate ceasefire and underlined our shared goals of a peaceful two-state solution. We are playing a leadership role in the United Nations Security Council, where we are calling for measures by all sides to reduce further violence. We will participate in the emergency UN General Assembly session later this week. The UK unequivocally condemns the firing of rockets at Jerusalem and other locations within Israel. We strongly condemn these acts of terrorism by Hamas and other terrorist groups who must permanently end their incitement and rocket fire against Israel. There is no justification for the targeting of civilians. Israel has a legitimate right to self-defence and to defend its citizens from attack. In doing so, it is, vit it is vital that all actions are proportionate, in line with international humanitarian law, and make every effort to avoid civilian casualties. We are aware of, the, uh, of medical institutions, a number of schools, and many homes in Gaza that have been destroyed or seriously damaged, and we are concerned that buildings housing media and humanitarian organisations, such as the Qatar Red Crescent, have been destroyed. We call on Israel to adhere to the principles of necessity and proportionality when defending its legitimate security interests. We are also concerned by reports that Hamas is once again using civilian infrastructure and populations as a cover for its military operations. Humanitarian access is essential, and we urge all parties to allow the unimpeded entry of vital humanitarian supplies. Hamas and other terrorist groups must cease their mortar attacks on these crossings. We urge all parties to work together to reduce tensions in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. The UK is clear that the historic status quo in Jerusalem must be respected. Violence against peaceful worshippers of any faith is unacceptable. Mr Speaker, the UK position on evictions, demolitions and settlements is clear and long-standing. We oppose these activities. We urge the Government of Israel to cease its policies related to settlement expansion immediately and instead work towards a two-state solution. Mr Speaker, the UK will continue our intensive diplomatic efforts in the region focused on securing a ceasefire and creating the conditions for a sustainable peace. Can I just remind people that we do have set times. So we've got to try and stick to them. Wayne Depp. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is of enormous concern to everyone in the House that in this conflict between Hamas and Israel, there have been nearly 300 people killed, including 65 children. This is truly appalling, and we condemn the rocket attacks by Hamas and the Israeli airstrikes, which have killed so many innocent people and severely damaged schools and medical facilities. I listened carefully to what the Minister had to say regarding the government's position and his uh, statement in favour of an immediate ceasefire. We have heard uh, in the last few hours that the French and Jordanian governments are making real efforts to bring about a UN resolution which will help secure an immediate ceasefire. We have heard that there have been discussions with the Egyptians and the Germans. Uh, the name of the United Kingdom government has not been mentioned. And I would ask the Minister if he would care to elaborate upon what representations he has recently made to secure that objective of an immediate ceasefire. Could I also press the Minister on what efforts his government is making to provide humanitarian support for the people of Gaza? 
and I would also urge the government to do everything it can to restart a meaningful peace process as a matter of urgency. If further conflagrations are to be prevented, we need a process which will uphold international law, end the illegal occupation of the Palestinian territories, and create a viable Palestinian state alongside a secure Israel. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for the recognition he has given as to the diplomatic work that the UK Government has put in. I can assure him that we remain fully committed to an immediate ceasefire and we are working to that end. As I say, the, uh, the Foreign Secretary spoke with his Jordanian opposite number um, just a few days ago and I spoke to ambassadors from the region just this morning. Uh, some of the diplomatic efforts are quite rightly done uh, very visibly through institutions such as the United Nations. Some, some are, and I'm sure he'll understand why, done perhaps more discreetly and quietly. The international community is pulling together, in both in the region, in Europe and in the United States, to try and bring about a meaningful ceasefire and work towards what can only be the, uh, the right way of bringing a um, permanent peace to the region, which is through negotiated political means. Israel has the right to defend its citizens from terrorist attack, and I welcome the Minister's strong confirmation of that this morning. Will he go further, though, uh, and send a message about terrorism by prescribing the whole of Hamas and also the IRGC that are making possible these horrific rocket attacks? Minister. I thank my right honourable friend for the, uh, for the points that she has made. She will know the military wing of Hamas is internationally recognised as a terrorist organisation and the entirety of Hamas is on a no contact. We have a no contact policy from the UK government. We enjoy a good working relationship with the leadership of the Palestinian Authority. Solutions to this will be done, need to be, must be done through negotiated political uh, means rather than through military means. She will also understand that we do not speculate on future prescriptions. We now go to SNP spokesperson Chris Law. Chris. Mr. Speaker, we are witnessing the second week of horrific violence in Israel and Palestine. It's reported that 10 have been killed by Hamas and over 200 have been killed by Israeli airstrikes, including 65 children. The SNP applauds all indiscriminate violence against civilians. So firstly, what further steps can the UK government take in demanding an immediate ceasefire? Mr Speaker, I'm incredibly proud that last month my city of Dundee voted to recognise Palestine as a nation state. So secondly, will the UK government today commit to recognising Palestine as an equal and independent nation state? The UN Secretary General has accused the Israeli government of acting contrary to their obligations under human rights law. Indeed, Amnesty International have highlighted potential war crimes by both Israel and Hamas. So thirdly, what pressures is the UK government bringing to investigate these shocking breaches? Lastly, Mr Speaker, UK arms export licences to Israel have increased by over 1,000% in the last two years. This is not neutrality. Therefore, finally, will the UK government immediately suspend these exports until they are thoroughly examined? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I... I I would urge the Honourable Gentleman, for whom I have a huge amount of respect, not to equate the legitimate government of Israel with a terrorist organisation, the military wing of Hamas. As I have said at the dispatch box a number of times, Israel has a right to self-defence, but we have also made it clear that we expect at all times for them to do so in accordance with international humanitarian law and make every effort to minimise civilian casualties. But ultimately, the best way of minimising civilian casualties is to bring this conflict to a conclusion. That is why we are working both with the Palestinian leadership, the government of Israel and our international partners both in the region and further afield to bring a timely end to this conflict, work towards a more permanent ceasefire and ultimately to a peaceful two-state solution. Let's go to Robert Halfer. Robert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, reports indicate that at least 500 Hamas rockets, one in seven of the total number fired, have exploded within Gaza, and a Palestinian NGO has confirmed that eight Palestinians were killed last week by a rocket that fell short. Does my most wonderful friend agree with me that Hamas rocket fire doesn't just threaten Israelis, it also causes great harm to ordinary Gazans and must be condemned in the strongest possible terms? 
Would he also acknowledge that far from being able to negotiate with the democratic Palestinian government, Israel is facing existential threats from Hamas and Hezbollah, extreme Islamist terrorist organizations funded and backed by Iran, and that there should be no moral equivalence between democratic Israel and the terrorism of Hamas and Hezbollah? Uh, Mr Speaker, the UK enjoys good relations both with the government of Israel and the Palestinian Authority, and I would urge uh, all members of the House and further afield to recognise that Hamas, which is uh, the, the military wing of which is recognised as a terrorist organisation, is no friend of the Palestinian people. We will work with the leadership of both um, the Palestinians and the Israelis, uh, alongside our friends and partners internationally, to work for peace, uh, because ultimately nobody wants to see continued images of, uh, of, of fatalities of either Palestinians or Israelis. Let's go to Leila Moran. Leila. Speaker. Last week, I read the names of four of the then 14 Palestinian children and one Israeli child who had died. And a week on, the number of Palestinian children dead is now 63 in Gaza alone. If my heart was broken before, it's shattered now. We need a ceasefire. And the UK shouldn't have left it to France to be the main sponsor of a UN resolution calling for it. This government is shirking its historic responsibility and it is time to step up. So today I wear my kufiya in recognition that if we want lasting peace, we cannot go back to how it was before. The police brutality, the demolitions and the oppression. We need a peace process that isn't doomed before it begins. So if this government is committed to a lasting peace, then why doesn't it recognise the state of Palestine? Uh, Mr Speaker, I recognise the Honourable Lady's passion uh, for the Palestinian people and her own uh, background, uh, and I completely understand how painful it is for her in particular, but for all of us, seeing images of those who have lost their lives. I can assure her that we are working with international partners, both at the United Nations uh, and more broadly, to bring about peace. When I last stood at the dispatch box in response to her urgent question, I made the case, uh, I made the point at, at then that the UK was pushing towards a cessation of violence and uh, ceasefire, and that we, we are absolutely committed to a meaningful two-state solution. Mr Speaker, the issue of Palestinian recognition is one that is uh, rightly to be debated in this House, but at this point, our focus is relentlessly on bringing about an immediate end to the conflict so that we can work in good time to a negotiated political solution and a two-state solution for the benefit of both the Israeli and the Palestinian peoples. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome my right honourable friend's statement and the commitment to a two-state solution. Can my right honourable friend update the House as to what extent we are using our presidency of the G7 to help to broker an international consensus for a ceasefire? Uh, I, uh, I, I thank the honourable lady for her, for her question. Uh, we, we are using all of our diplomatic contact, uh, contacts and our diplomatic uh, leverage. Um, understandably, the United Nations is uh, the predominant multilateral body through which we are working. But as I say, I spoke to a meeting of the Arab ambassadors uh, just uh, this morning. Uh, we are ambivalent as to which organisation helps bring about peace, and we'll work with whomever, wherever uh, we feel able to uh, apply um, uh, positivity. But I can assure her that we will, we will leave no stone unturned in our efforts to bring about an end to this conflict. Dr Rupert Huck. The sad aftermath of a tragedy where children pulled from the rubble are considered lucky amongst the three-figure death toll is, he said it himself, newly displaced people from their homes, double refugees, destroyed schools, hospitals, cultural centres, all at a time when we're cutting our aid contribution internationally. Would he agree with his two recent predecessors, Alistair Burt and Alan Duncan, that although he stated it again, UK government policy is against illegal settlements and for a two-state solution, our long-standing lack of proactivity sometimes looks like we don't really mean this. And the only real victor of all this is Netanyahu. Until recently, a caretaker leader of an inconclusive ele 
uh, election that's now, he's now well cemented himself. Um, Mr Speaker, the, uh, the outcome of democratic elections in the State of Israel is, uh, is for the Israeli people. We will continue to work with uh, the government that the Israeli people elect, but it, it does strike me that that is a, an important but fundamentally different issue to the one that uh, is the subject of the urgent question today. We will work with international partners, with the Israelis, with the Palestinians, to bring peace to the region, both in terms of this specific conflict, which we seek to resolve as quickly as possible, and ultimately for a sustainable, prosperous two-state solution. That remains the UK government's policy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Iran's role in this conflict is just one more example of uh, Iranian efforts to undermine peace and stability throughout the Middle East via its proxy terror group allies. Uh, given that it was exactly this kind of behaviour that many warned was a blind spot in the JCPOA agreement, what assurances can my right friend give today that the current discussions around resuscitating that agreement won't just repeat that mistake all over again and give a free pass to Iran to continue rearming its Hamas allies? Uh, Mr Speaker, my right honourable friend makes uh, an incredibly important point and we recognise that uh, in, our, uh, in our desire to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapon, we cannot be blind to their broader regional uh, destabilising activity. That will remain one of the UK's priorities. Um, it is something which is regularly raised with me by uh, my interlocutors uh, in the region and I can assure him that that will be at the forefront of our minds throughout the forthcoming negotiations. Richard Black. Thank you, Mr Speaker. How many more Palestinian children have to be killed? How many more Palestinian homes have to be reduced to rubble? How many more Palestinian schools and hospitals have to be bombed before the British government takes the action necessary to finally force the Israeli government to stop its war on the Palestinian people? Surely now is the time for all UK weapon sales to Israel to be stopped. Surely now is the time for sanctions on the Israeli government for its repeated violations of international law. And surely now is the time. This House voted for it back in 2014 to recognise the state of Palestine because Palestine has the right to exist. Uh, Mr Speaker, I would remind the Honourable Gentleman of the sequencing of the events that have uh, unfolded in uh, Gaza in Israel. Israel's actions were in response to indiscriminate rocket attacks from an internationally recognised terrorist organisation. Israel has the right to self-defence. We have urged them at every step to do so proportionately and, 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 and make every step that they are able to to minimise civilian casualties. I am sure, like him, I am horrified when, uh, sorry, I'm sure, like me, he is horrified when we see images of fatalities, whether they be Israeli or Palestinians. And that is why, whilst the issue of recognition is an important one, it is not for now. Now it's about bringing this conflict to an end. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I welcome the Minister's statement here today? But given our history uh, and our legacy there, could I ask Britain leans into this more? Uh, we call for a ceasefire. Let's ask the United States to join us there as well. It's difficult to see how any tactical or strategic advantage could be gained from either side continuing this conflict. Um, but once we get to that ceasefire, of course, those old legacy challenges will remain. And Israel will require a partner to work with. And my concern is that Palestinian elections have not taken place for about 16 years. And Hamas is now supported by the Iranians, and has no interest in either working with Fatah in the West Bank, let alone the Israelis. So would my right honourable friend agree that perhaps the neighbouring Muslim countries, particularly those who just signed the Abraham Accords, could be invited to help uh, encourage Palestinians to hold fresh elections so we get more representative voices for which Israel can then work with? Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. He makes uh, an incredibly important point. The UK has been fully supportive of elections uh, for the Palestinian Authority, which are now uh, well overdue. We have seen on numerous occasions the Palestinian Authority uh, working and uh, coordinating with the Government of Israel, and we are always supportive when that is the case. 
Um, the actions taken by Hamas are not to the benefit of the Palestinian people. The solution to the conflict, both in the short term and ultimately, will be through a negotiated political solution. And I would urge the Palestinian people to choose leadership who are respected on the international stage and are able to negotiate with international partners. John. Um, Mr. Speaker, I thank the, the uh, Minister for his very, very balanced response to the questions that have been put. The, the Minister knows that uh, Hamas is trying to make the Palestinian Authority and Mahmoud Abbas redundant to make him appear relevant to present themselves as the ultimate defenders of Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa.